Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, depending on where, where and when you're watching this. And thanks for um, choosing this presentation. Uh, I'm Farboud Fumani, and I have many years of uh, research experience at Security Compass and at, in academia and also in industry. And I'm technical pro, pro, uh, product manager of security research at Security Compass. And previously, I was researcher and a senior researcher and lead researcher. And my research interests include privacy engineering and include security engineering and um, considering my background, the use of AI and machine learning methods to automate them. So I have divided this presentation into four different sections. And in the first section, I'm going to talk about the opportunity and challenge here, uh, here and why we are talking about this. So we're going to talk about privacy modeling for cloud services based on the compliance regulation. So there are three important components here, cloud services, privacy modeling, and finally, compliance regulations. So this is a very typical situation. I'm sure you have been in this situation that you've had a number of standards, compliance regulations, laws that you have to abide by and you have to comply with. And you, you were creating a process or a product or a solution, and you didn't know how you can relate, how you can bridge between the uh, compliance mandates and between the, the actual task that you had to create for the technology and, and the features that you, that you had to create with the technology. This is the problem that uh, has fascinated me for a while and I have focused on this problem. And threat modeling is one of the very important and useful tools for privacy engineering that uh, tries to solve this problem. Uh, so what is threat modeling? So I, I, I looked at different definitions of threats and uh, one of the most uh, reliable ones and uh, most quoted ones are uh, from NIST 800. 160 that says that threat is an event or condition that has the potential for causing asset loss and undesirable consequences. So what does it mean for privacy? So I'm going to talk about the challenge that we have in privacy. So uh, this quote from Benjamin Franklin, I think actually summarizes our situation with privacy. It says it takes many good deeds to build good reputation and only one bad one to lose it. So it, in my opinion, it's very much, um, very much related to privacy. And in privacy, the, the consequences include uh, fines and reputa reputational damages and many things and many other consequences that you, can, you, you may incur as a result. So the challenge is that privacy threat modeling as a tool is not well known. Not a lot of people know about uh, the privacy threat modeling techniques that exist in the literature, and that is actually an opportunity. So by learning about these ideas that I'm explaining today, uh, and, I, and I will pro I pro I'll provide a lot of references and links, you will be ahead of the curve, and you will, you will be able to have impact in your organization, and you can go back and apply those uh, ideas to your uh, problem and then uh, have, a, have a positive impact and influence and contribution in your organization and for the problem that you are solving. The other, um, the other important challenge that we have here is cloud. Cloud has a shared responsibility model between the provider and the consumer, and you have indirect control over data and over the processes. So that also complicates uh, the privacy engineering of cloud services and cloud solutions. But what's the opportunity here? So this is my goal opportunity statements. What I'm saying is that with having regulation-based privacy threat modeling for cloud services, we can avoid all the privacy risk and we can, uh, we can achieve compliance and privacy by design with minimal overhead. So again, throughout the presentation, pay attention to three different concepts and components, cloud, privacy threat modeling, and compliance, compliance-driven or compliance-aware uh, privacy threat modeling. So in the talk, I'll talk about different privacy threat modeling methods, and I will compare, compare and contrast them. I will share my own experience with you and also the experience of other people that have used them 
And I hope that I will give you some tools that you can use for your own uh, problem. So the next section will be about privacy threat modeling. So I have chosen these four, um, four different uh, threat modeling techniques, privacy threat modeling techniques, uh, from a wealth of different um, methods, from many, from a myriad of different methods that exist in the literature. So if these slides don't render correctly because of the difference between the systems. Um, so the I've chosen Linden, QTTM, CPTM, and Privacy Tagging. And we have chosen them selectively for a reason. So Linden gets its threat from a threat, a number of predefined threat categories. Uh, CPTM is, first of all, it's mostly, it's, it's mainly and chiefly designed for cloud, and it gets its requirement from some privacy requirements and from compliance. QTTM works on some privacy goals. And I also introduced the work that we had done uh, previously on privacy tagging. Um, during this research, I have looked at all of the other methods, and um, there, I'm only, I only chose these four methods to, to be able to tell a story, but there are also other methods that you can go and check um, including Propan, Square, Pris, and all of these links uh, take you to the research initi initiatives that have worked on different methods. But for the sake of this presentation and for the, for the sake of um, conciseness and brevity, I have chosen only these methods. But all those other methods also have similar elements and common elements with this one. I start from Linden. Linden was is the result of research at, at KU Leeuwen University. And uh, you, can, you can read more about this in um, Mina Deng and Kim Boyd's uh, thesis, uh, PhD thesis at, in 2010 and 2015. Uh, Linden was inspired by Stride. So you're probably familiar with the Stride that is uh, used for security threat modeling. So Linden, these are the steps in Linden. So you draw a data flow diagram, and then you map Linden categories to the end, end elements of data flow diagram, and you find the threats, and then you prioritize, analyze them, and design require mitigation methods. So if you look at this, the, third, the first three steps are in the problem space. You, you try to find the problem, and uh, this, this is where we are focused today. So we're just paying attention to the problem space, finding the threats. So I talked about uh, data flow diagram and Linden. So what is Linden, you ask, and what is data flow diagram? So the Linden team define a number of root threats or a number of category of threats. And uh, they're and this uh, Linden is actually a mnemonic is an acronym for these diff different type of threats. Uh, so the first one is linkability. So the ability to link two items of interest. For example, you can say that you may not be, be able to identify the, the sender and receiver of message, but you say that uh, this person has, has sent a message to this person. So these two people are linked. Uh, the other concepts that is uh, coded there is identifiability, which is clear that you can identify the subject from some evidence. Uh, we have non-repudiation there, which is the, exactly the opposite of what we have in security, uh, which uh, he, though here it is a threat, but in, the, in security is, it's a goal. Uh, we have detectability, which means that whether something exists or not, an example of that that Linden team gives is, for example, whether a celebrity has a court case or a record in the hospital or something like that. You, uh, you, whether, you, you want to know if there is a record, but you may not be able to link it to something or you may not be, be able to identify it. So it's not disclosure of information, but just the fact that you know whether it exists or not is detectability. And then you have obviously disclosure information that has some overlap with CIA and security and unawareness, which is being unaware of the consequences of doing something 
in the past, now, uh, or in the future. And uh, finally, non-compliance. And you can see how they have coded the entire uh, legislatory domain and compliance in one threat. So these are different threats in Linda method. So what is data flow diagram? So data flow diagram actually shows the flow of data through a process or a system. So there are four main um, elements in a data flow diagram. The th the, uh, one of the elements is data store, where you store the data. You have an external entity that is normally a user or administrator or other systems. You have the flow of data and you have a process. And also you have a trust boundary uh, and the trust boundary of system shows where the sub elements of the subsystem um, trust one another. So I've shown a diagram here and uh, it shows uh, on, on the top, it shows the architecture diagram for a typical application. And you see that there's a mobile device that connects to a web application that is hosted in an app engine. And then it, the app engine connects, connects to a database on cloud SQL. And uh, you see on the bottom, on the bottom half of the page that uh, it shows the, that in DFT. It shows only one of the processes in DFT. So it's the user registers themselves and then it's the data is stored in the database. So this, you can see that you can have for, for an architecture, you may have many DFTs, which each of which focuses on one process. So how do you do Linden uh, back? So you look at different elements of DFT. For each element, you try to apply L-I-N-D-D-U-N. -D -D so you, you look at user database and you see how linkability, identifiability, non-reputation and all are applicable there. Uh, so this, these two diagrams I've taken from um, some from Kim Boyce um, 2014 and 2019 papers and documents. Uh, the first one on the left shows uh, the one of the threats and the sub threats, the ca subcategory of threats, which uh, they call concrete threats. And the top is like root threat. So you, you break down the root threat into some concrete threat and do the study. Uh, it's very much like if you are familiar with attack trees, this is threat tree with threat tree, which is very similar to attack tree. And on the bottom, you see that you have to repeat this process of applying Linden concepts to various elements of um, DFT. So for example, if you have five data flows, you have to look at all those five data flows and, and think about Linden uh, and then see how they apply to this situation and what, what kind of concrete threats they create. So you have to, to start from Linden from the one of the elements and go back and create the threat tree. Uh, there's a more, there's a lot more to be said about Linden, and there's um, and in the references there are a lot of links that you can use to learn more about Linden. I have summarized my own experience and um, also other people's opinion about Linden here. Linden, in my opinion, is the most developed and advanced method for privacy threat modeling. There's a wealth of information about uh, Linden. Some of the threat categories are not my favorite, and also I've seen that other people have reported this. Um, some of these categories may, may not be applicable or may not even be a goal to avoid, like for example, detectability in particular situation, especially when you look at some of the DFT elements. Also, these, uh, this work that they have done on different levels of threats and attack tree, uh, threat trees are not reusable and are not, may not be generic for all of the problems. So you have to do this again. And uh, the last and maybe the most important part is that uh, it's, it's introduced as by element, by element threat modeling. And uh, for each of the DFT elements, you have to analyze Linden. So if you look at their table, there are 21 threat categories for a simple DFT of only four elements. For each element, each 
example for each for for elements so for example this uh, simple example that I showed with only four elements you have to analyze 21 threads and I don't know how the scalable it is so we talked about Linden and now we want to transition to cloud privacy threat modeling and the reason that I chose to talk about CPTM is that it's it gets its threat categories from somewhere else. And that is the privacy requirement. So CPTM is based on privacy requirement. What does this mean? So CPTM is the result of uh, Ali Golami research and uh, they have published their work in 2014, 2016. There is another advanced CPTM uh, with minor changes to the original CPTM and the uh, I have summarized the algorithm for CTP, CPTM here is that you, you go and analyze the cloud environment, you identify architecture, actors, assets, then you look at, you, you, you get a source of privacy requirements. And that is the interesting part. And that's why I chose CPTM. So you, for example, you say that I want to, so because the, the work was older, they, they didn't use GDPR, for example, they used data privacy Directive, Directive 95, and they got the requirements from there. So they, they the requirements were lawfulness, informed consent, purpose finding, data minimization, and all. So you get those requirements, and then you correlate cloud actors and actors that, that are specified in law. For example, if you have cloud provider, it translates to a data co controller. And then, um, sorry, the cloud provider, it might, it might, in different situations, it might translate to processor or it, it, it might translate to controller. So you correlate those uh, requirements and then you, for each of the pri privacy requirements, you extract a number of threats. So they, they, the way that they have coded is that they say that threat I and J comes from the privacy requirement I and the threat number J, the actual threat J. So I, I give an example from their biobank research. So we know that privacy requirement two is informed consent. Then what they do is that they think about cloud and then they come up with excessive term of service as the actual threats under this informed consent. So this is the first one in the category of informed consent and that will be T21 and then they go and prioritize this. Um, I'll try to give the pros and cons of CPTM. So it's driven by compliance requirements. This is positive. So you can use any set of requirements. It could be any law, any, uh, any standards. Uh, the difficulty or the challenge that I found with CPTM is that was that it doesn't specify how you get from architecture, actors, and assets to those actual threats. So you, it tells you that you go and um, draw an architecture diagram, identify actors, identify assets. It also says I look at the PI, PRI, but there's not an established process from these two elements to the threats. Okay. So we learned about Linden and their threat categories. We learned about CPTM and the fact that you can get privacy requirements from different sources and the fact that they have introduced uh, that for cloud. Uh, the third system that I'm going to introduce is QTTM. So QTMM, sorry, QTM is similar to Linden in problem space, but it gets, instead of those, uh, acronyms and those categories, those predefined categories, it uses a different set of privacy and security goals. That solves one of the problems that we mentioned. So the steps of Q QTTM in the problem space is exactly like Linton. So you draw a data flow diagram, but in, instead of now, you get some privacy goals that I will explain later in the next slides, and then you apply them to the elements of DFT, and then you come up with threats. The rest of the method is not is outside our scope because it's like about the quantification of the attack trees and quantification of the risk, which is, which is outside the scope. But in the problem space, it's exactly the same of Linden. 
So what are the privacy goals that they used? So in the security space, the, the privacy goals that they used was CIA. And in the uh, privacy spa space, they used, they um, borrowed the privacy goals from uh, another paper, Privacy Protection Goals uh, of 2011, uh, an, an IEEE paper, and they have published their work in uh, an IEEE conference. And uh, this is, I've, uh, I've taken this from the paper. The, this is the data flow diagram. Again, the same, same, same um, flow as Linden. You get each of the elements of data flow diagram and then create attack trees. They called it attack trees as, threat, as opposed to threat trees. And the circles shows attacks and the rectangles, uh, sorry, the circles uh, shows threats and um, the rectangles shows attacks. So what is new in QTTM and what are the pros and cons? So obviously the me method is very similar to Linton in the problem space, only the threat categories are different. But I wanted to give you a quote from their study. And it's very interesting. And it was very interesting for me because it actually validated what my own experience and I, it, it resonated with me. So they said that performing a comprehensive security and privacy analysis with this methodology required a big set of parameters. They were talking about Linden. So they said that if we wanted to use Linden instead of our privacy goals, we had to do, we had to take six for security and by six they, mean, they meant to strike. And seven for privacy, Linden. And they had this ambiguity around like non-repudiation and unlinkability. And also they mentioned that there was a missing concept which was intervenability. Um, so I really liked the, the concept of inter intervenability. So let's go back, back to this slide. So the security CIA is clear, but in privacy domain, they mentioned un unlinkability, which has a similar concept in Linden. They mentioned transparency, which is somehow new if you don't relate it to the compliance, non-compliance in Linden, and also intervenability, which I think, I, in my own experience, I found it useful and necessary to consider when you're doing threat modeling, because a lot of regulation, especially, ask for intervenability, ask for uh, allowing user, ask for user control, control of user over their own data. So what they say is that, first of all, Linden was too complicated. Not all of the concepts would apply in their own um, experience. And also, they, they wanted the concepts of, in concept of intervenability. That's from 2012 paper. And then I also found it useful to quote from Adam Shostak book. Uh, he also says that uh, Adam Shostak is the author of uh, Designing for Security, a threat modeling design for security book. And he also says that Linton leaves your author deeply conflicted. Uh, the privacy terminology it relies on will be challenging for many readers. However, 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 it is one of the most serious and thought provoking approaches to privacy threat modeling, which I agree with. Uh, the other challenge that I wanted to mention and actually related to the last code was that, again, for if you want to do Linden for a very simple diagram with four elements, you have, you'll have 21 threats, uh, which when you're doing threat modeling by elements, most of, or some of these threats are not meaningful. So there's another, another idea of threat modeling per interaction uh, that you, you focus on interactions instead of each elements of DFT, you focus on, on the entire interaction. And I quote from a 2017 paper that is protection strategies are normally enough to protect systems. So um, I, I don't have enough time to explain the whole idea of uh, privacy threat modeling per interaction, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a per interaction way of threat modeling that I've tried to use in my uh, own method that I'm going to propose. So the last idea that I'm going to share with you 
is based on our own research. We presented this with uh, Mina, Miri, and um, Constantin K at different uh, venues uh, in uh, IEEE Privacy Symposium and also in ISACA Journal and, and AFSEC Conference. The idea behind tagging, and you can go and read about that, it's there's a huge room to develop this for privacy engineering, but uh, the challenge that we had and want to address and the problem that we wanted to solve was that how could we identify the features, the software features that are needed to comply with GDPR and how, how could we ensure that GDPR requirements were met? So we came, with, we came up with the idea of a tagging system, which was, a, was an abstract layer between regulations and the task and user stories. Uh, so I, I really, I, I want to be brief about this. So you look at one, I will only give a number of examples. So you look at article four, seven of GDPR, and then you read about right to withdraw, and then you code it in a tag. And this it's the idea comes from and is inspired by uh, grounded theory and different type of open coding, axial coding, and selective coding that you, you, you do there. And then you come up with a number of codes and tags. Um, I will go to the examples. Um, this is one example. Just let's focus on one example. Again, the slide is not rendered correctly. Uh, so the example starts from Article 12, Recital 58, or Article 12, uh, Article 12, Recital, Recital, and Recital 59 of GDPR. And we looked at that and we tagged it into transparency, a whole program, and then we wrote a user story, which specifies the goal uh, from a user's perspective. So it says that as a user, I want to be able, able to freely access information about processing activities that involves my personal data so that I can exercise my right to view my process data. So this is a user story. Then the slide shows how we got from the mandate to the tag and to that from that to the user story. There's another example here. Again, tag user story mandate. And uh, you look at the compliance regulations mandates, you find a tag and then you turn it into user story. So you, you, we had tens of user stories based, uh, based on GDPR and I want you to, in this slide, I want you to focus on the user story. So we had these user stories. I, I only read the first one, like as a user, I want to be able to edit, update my information in the system so that I can ensure accuracy of uh, any, and have control. I can ensure the accuracy of and have control over my data. So the third part is where is the synthesis this, which I, I'll try to put everything together and give you some tools and tips about this. Uh, so this is probably my favorite slide of all time about uh, combining and merging different standards. Um, I give you two, three seconds to take a look at this if you haven't seen it. Uh, and so whenever you try to merge everything and create a new thing that unifies everything else, it's probably, uh, it's an illusion. It's hard to do that because different standards try to solve different problems. But yet I tried to do this and I tried to put everything together and create a taxonomy and relationship between uh, all the elements of uh, cloud privacy threat modeling. So, And this is actually a summary of everything that I said so far and summary of my study and research on various different types of privacy threat modeling. So I see this pattern that you can get your threats from goals. And the example of goals was obviously QTTM method that they use some privacy protection goals, or you can get from threat category. Uh, what's the example of that? Correct, Linda. And you can get that from compliance requirements. For example, in case of CPTM, they got, they got that from the Directive 95, EU Directive 95. And then you arrive at the threat. So now, whatever the threats are, you apply those threats to the cloud service. 
And then I tried to code that with the diam in the diameter of circles. I, I, would, I would like to suggest that you should put this much, much emphasis on different uh, elements of DFT. So entity usually less, but data store, data flow more. And I would like to ask you to focus more on interaction and processes. And then by applying those, you write requirements and features that are needed. The other um, idea that's shared here is that the compliance requir requirements can be can give parameters to the threats. I'll give you examples. And then the compliance requirements also can, can define the requirements and with a in a with, with in, a, in a quantitative way and with some kind of parameters. I will explain more. So this is the whole um, scheme and framework that I'm suggesting. So I'm suggesting that you can use any set of goals and threats that you're comfortable with. It could be Linden. It could be, I'm, I'm actually suggesting some other ways that you can do that. Privacy protection goals that the CPTM, that the QTTM um, team has used. You can use GAP uh, or you can use GPS, the, the, the global privacy standard that uh, Anne Kowakian has, has created and also you can, uh, for example, get the IAPP Fair Information Practice Principles. I did that based on our own um, user stories, and I went through all of our user stories and tried, tried to find out what the threat was that this user story became necessary based on the compliance regulation. So that is actually indirectly coding the compliance reg regulation and translating it into threat category. And also I mapped it to Linden and goals. So based on my own study, so this is the result of my own work. I'm not saying that this is the only way that you can come up with those threats, but this is one of the ways that you can do this. And uh, I came up with four categories, lack of control, lack of protection, lack of minimality and lack of transparency. And under, which, under, under each of them, there are a number of subcategories of threats uh, or concrete threats and with the definition of them. So again, this is not the only way that you can do. And if you ask if I had doubts about where I should put these threats and concrete threats, yes, obviously I did have doubts. And uh, there are many ways to do this, many ways to create a hierarchy and taxonomy. Uh, so the next step is that focus on the, on the interaction. Uh, so this is an example that has all the elements of cloud. Uh, uh, and I chose an example and, and, and I, I did the threat modeling on this, but the reason that I chose this example was that it had all the el typical elements that uh, we needed. So it's a mood diary that people take selfies of themselves. They upload it to the application. The application saves, serves, saves the store, saves, saves the pictures on cloud storage and some, and it's, uh, connects to the cloud vision, a vision API, understand how happy or sad the person is, and then stores data on a regular basis on cloud SQL and also logs, use the cloud login. So we don't have time to go to the details of this application, but I, uh, I can show you that you can, you can go through all these concepts, different kind of threats and threat categories, and then uh, see whether they apply to this particular or typical service. And then if yes, then you can go one step further. So you look, you look at the threat categories and you look at a typical service and then you look at various interactions that it has and you will be able to, before, even beforehand, we will be able to collectively have typical services and have typical processes and interactions under each of the services. And then we can code them. And so we'll have a pre-populated list of threats for generic services. Then we'll identify some kind of relevance or applicability criteria. I've shown two of these examples just for the sake of simplicity. So the first one, you, we know that we have lack of control is a threat and lack of control over agreement is a threat. So the question is that are user agreement requirements at rest under this component or it's addressed somewhere else because you need to address this probably once for the whole system you don't have to address this or mention it as a threat for each of the components 
The other rel applicability criteria that I've given an ex example is that what another threat is lack of data protection for the data transfer to a third party or third country. So the question is, is the data transferred to a third country or region or it's locally uh, stored? So based on the answer to this problem, this particular threat becomes active or not. So you will, using your tool, you will have a subset of threats. So you start with pre-populated list of threats for generic services. There are a number of questions that you answer and there will be a subset of threats that you'll get. And the last point that I want to share with you, the last step of this framework and this process is parameterizing threats or parameterizing the requirements based on a regulation. And it only gives some examples. So we know that different, requ different uh, regulations have different requirements, right? How do we code them? How do we, ma how do we make different threats based on the requirements of uh, their regulations? So you can do that in two ways. One way is that you can parameterize the threats. So the threats that I mentioned, I will give only a few examples. Like let's, let's consider LGPD, which is um, enforced in Brazil and GDPR, which is the EU, EU law of data privacy. So we know that for example, we have lack of control on data access, right? So GDPR allows 30 day to answer access requests and LGPD 50, 15 days. So you have two ways. You, you, you can either code these as part of the threat analysis, or you can code them as part of the requirement generation. The other example is lack of transparency or breach notification. For example, GDPR uh, asks for 70, maximum of 72 hours after a breach to notify the users and LGPD says reasonable time. Or lack of transparency over the legal ground. Uh, GDPR applies to obviously all the all EU citizens, but uh, LG, if LG, LGPD doesn't apply if the uh, processing is not done in the country, uh, but GDPR applies even if the processing is outside the country on the data from the from the from EU uh, residents. Uh, or for example, LGPD provides additional grounds for process, processing of data on the basis of for for research purposes for. Uh, uh, for legal in legal circumstances and for health and credit data protection. So again, you can parameterize the data, um, parameterize based on the requirements of the regulation uh, in for the threats or for the for the requirements that are are associated with the threats. So my last slides are conclusion and some suggestion for the future. But I have summarized everything again and reiterated the same thing again here. So we start with any set of privacy threats. It, you, can, you can compile that list based on the compliance. You can uh, compile that list based on requirements. Uh, and uh, it could be compliance, but it could, it could be requirement based. It could be uh, goal driven and it could be category driven. I gave four examples of um, with examples of each that you can you can use any of the sources to compile a list of threats. Then you need to apply the threat analysis to the interaction of the cloud services. Again, I want to emphasize that um, focus on processes and focus on the interactions. And uh, you can you need to also define those relevance or ap applicability rules for the threats. And uh, this makes it repeatable and scalable because you can do that on the generic services, for example, for logging and identity management for storage. And then there will be a question, number of questions that you answer and a subset of threats will be given to you instead of an analyzing the DFT for each of the LF components again. And the last part is that you can parameterize the threats or associated uh, requirements based on the regulations. Um, I gave examples of all of this. Um, the, my last points are that um, um, privacy threat modeling is chiefly compliance driven. So I really suggest that we should start from compliance, try to code the compliance. It doesn't mean that we cannot go to threat categories like Lind, uh, the categories that Linden has uh, has introduced or the or other privacy protection goals, but uh, mainly starting from compliance is very helpful. 
Um, this was my uh, opportunity goal statement. Again, I want to reiterate this, that by regulation-based privacy threat modeling, we can achieve both compliance and privacy by, by design with minimal overhead. This will be, the process will be re repeatable and we have to do it once for a number of um, services, cloud services, typical services. Um, I think future research and work should, should focus on modeling typical interaction processes for cloud services. I showed some examples of that. Modeling relevance and applicability criteria for threats and processes, which again, I showed that for LGPD and GDPR and also coding compliance specifics as parameters. And then last one, and maybe the most important one is creating an, a data exchange format between customers and providers that if when we create this kind of uh, privacy information and privacy pre-populated list, we can communicate and we can reuse the data. Uh, that was all I had to say. And I really hope that what I said and what I shared with you has been useful for you and you have tools to and take it back to your organization and to your own problem and try to solve problem uh, with this uh, tools and techniques. Thank you very much.